ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to David Adelman. Oh. Right, I'm a northerner. I've just been told that it's, it's so nice to have a northern accent open up the programme. And I just said, what northern accent? Because where I come from, I'm posh. <laughs> um, hands up, quick show of hands. Who's here today for the first time? For the first time. Just want to... Okay, so awful lot of regulars. Okay. Right. Um... As Sheila quite rightly said, I'm here to <clears throat> give a wake-up call. Uh, I am in education, but very loosely. I'm freelance, really. I'm more of an author and a speaker than an educator. But, um, yes, it's a wake-up call. I, it's a very deep, dark message that I have. I'll try and keep it as light as possible. Promise, guarantee that we'll finish on a light note. I think it's F-sharp, if memory serves. And... I have material for three days, so I'm really hoping that the other speakers really won't mind if I'm still speaking by Sunday evening. You know, I don't want to offend anyone, I'm just giving them advance notice. So, a little survey, two questions. Hands up here who had a school education. There's more to this question than meets the eye. Well, I've got almost an hour to convince you that maybe you didn't. Hands up here, the second question, out of two, so there's no more. Hands up here who's done military service. Just a handful. Well, again, I've got an hour to persuade the rest of you that you've also done a form of military service. If you've been to a mainstream school, it's a form of military service. If you don't believe me, we'll talk about it in the coffee break after an hour, because uh, I hope to persuade you that you have. Right, let's crack on. So I'm breaking this talk down into three main sections. The first section is to persuade you that, in fact, schooling and education are two entirely different things, two, two different animals. Education is user-friendly and benign, creative, centered on the individual, and schooling is more or less the precise opposite. It's a form of indoctrination and training designed to basically schooling, if education does that, allows you to expand, schooling does this, wants you to contract so you'll fit into a model. The second section will be the eight functions of schooling. Now, I've given you a Brucey bonus because I love Glastonbury so much. It was advertised as six. There were originally six. One was added by um, the Secretary of State for Education under the regime of, uh, see, regime, full of military terms this talk, under the regime of Ronald Reagan. That was uh, Charlotte Thompson Isabet. She added a seventh function. And yours truly has added an eighth for, the, for people of more spiritual bent, I've just given a slight change of perspective on it. Uh, and as I promised to finish on a positive note, we'll look at the antidotes. I'm only here for an hour, so I can't really go into much depth about the antidotes. I'll leave you um, guessing what the detail might be. Oh, here's one suggestion. Buy the book. First shameless plug. This talk is inspired by a book that I wrote from, from based on my experiences. And um, if you feel that your interest has been piqued, it's available around the back there. Okay, so section one. Schooling versus education. What do we learn at school? Not a lot, no. Uh, how learning works. Now, from the, this is recent science. From the age of 0 to 7, we're in a state of altered receptivity, altered consciousness, basically, which is why children, babies and young children, tots, learn so fast. They're literally receiving downloads from all around them. So they pick up the mother tongue simply by being exposed to it. They pick up all kinds of motor skills simply by doing them, you know, within a short space of time there, or even by seeing them. 
So it's kind of monkey see, monkey do from the age of naught to seven. So if you send a child to school before that age, you're risking them picking up bad habits. So which is why Finland and some of the Scandinavian countries, more enlightened countries than we are, don't send their children to school till about the age of eight. Now, from the age of eight, we learn through repetition. And there's a clue to what's going to come next. Basically, you learn from just doing something again, saying something again and again. I must not talk in class. I must not talk in... See, you see? Just repetition. So it's not intuitive. It's more mechanical. So there's the... Um, this is the idea that I'm trying to get across about school. It's if you step out of line... There's a firing squad waiting for you. That firing squad can be official, part of the schooling system, or it could just be your peer group. Because apparently now in India, the finding that children are taking extreme delight in the punishment of other children. So if, if child A gets punished, all the other children from B to Z um, are delighted that it's not them. Yeah? What do we learn at school? Let's be more specific. Okay, this is obviously not an exhaustive list. It's just to give you an idea. We learn to pay constant attention, obey instructions, take tests, usually meaningless tests, sit still, be quiet. Collaboration is cheating. So if you've ever wondered why it's so difficult, I mean... Glastonbury, I think, is a much more friendly place that I'm used to. So maybe you're not as frightened of, uh, as we are of our neighbour. But when you've been trained into not trusting the other because you'll get punished if you talk to them or collaborate them with them in some way, it creates a lifelong problem. Your time is not your own. No, no, when you're in school, your time is school time. Five days a week from nine till three, nine till four, whatever. Being busy keeps us safe. So the work ethic is inculcated at school. So if you go off into the world of work desperately needing to be busy and to be productive, well, my case is that it was your schooling that helped cement that feeling. And it's not good for us. What else do we learn at school? Not to think for ourselves, not to question anything. If you were, if you were, or if you thought you were running the world, wouldn't you need mindless cooperative slaves who can't think for themselves? I would. There's nothing worse than running a show when everyone's questioning you and doubting you. You need certainty. Certainty comes from the lack of freedom to question. You learn to accept an external authority, the white coat. I haven't been to the doctors for a very, very long time. And when I did, it was just because I didn't know what was wrong with me. I just needed some information. But so many people just seem to go to the white coat or equivalent. Could be for legal advice, doctor for medical advice. Uh, we surrender our power too easily, way, way, way too easily. That others make decisions? Are we not supposed to live in a democracy? How many democratic schools are there? Two, three, four. There's a Sudbury model that's got a few schools attached to it. There's Steiner, there's one or two. But it's literally a handful. Whereas mainstream has tens of thousands of schools where you have what I call TDT, top-down tyranny. Others make decisions that affect you. So they get you used to not making a decision that's relevant to your life, you know? Corroding your sense of self. The expert always knows best. It's kind of related to accepting an external authority. If any, I know so many people that watch Britain's Got Talent and programmes like that um, because um, they regard other people's talents as a form of expertise that they cannot even aspire to. Yeah? So it's not just uh, an, an expert with information, it's an expert with talent. It's someone with more talent. You know? I'm not worthy. 
but somebody else clearly is. So I'll just sit back and watch the telly and make do with passivity. Attendance is everything. Well, now with the uh, schools being run on increasingly corporate economic models, uh, they need attendances up. And it's not a moral issue, it's not an educational issue. Never, never was. It's pure economics. Children are referred to in management meetings as units. And I know uh, a teacher, I know of a teacher actually, I don't know her personally. She went to an educational, co so called educational conference, really it's a schooling conference, not long ago, and heard the children referred to as the product. Yeah, it's, it's not as bad as we think. It's far worse, folks, and it's getting worse by the day. We have little or no choice. Back to the democracy. You know, you, you're, you're force-fed. You're force-fed with everything, well, pretty much everything. And what little tokenism they paid to, to music, dance, art, sport which they did do in the past, to be fair, to some degree. Uh, that's being replaced by maths, English, chemistry, physics, whatever. I know a teacher who's recently quit because he wanted to teach music. They, his school wouldn't let him. They, they insisted that he taught chemistry. Just what every child needs is a bit of chemistry, isn't it? You know? Now, the odd child would, would, want, would have an ambition to be a some kind of chemist, that's fair enough, but that's one out of 30, maybe two. The other 28 or 29 are not being catered for. They want to learn an instrument or they want to play games. What school taught me? Texting without looking. Yeah, children are really clever. They'll find ways of bucking the system. What do we not learn at school? Take self-responsibility. If we're being force-fed, then we don't, need to, we don't need to make any key decisions. It's all on a plate. And then later on in life, that lack of self-responsibility translates into the visit to the doctor's surgery. We haven't looked after our health. Translates into a visit to a lawyer. We haven't looked after our wealth. We haven't taken precautions. Or to marriage guidance, we haven't looked after our relationships. Or to all kinds of things where we haven't owned up to who we are and what we really want. True resilience. I got my experience in education mainly as a um, teacher of a card game. I was funded to go around schools across the entire country. The closest I got to here was Bristol. And um, the activity that I teach is a team card game called Bridge. Anyone heard of Bridge? Yeah. The simplified version for schools is called Mini Bridge, which the Dutch and the French created. And at that game, like any interactive game, you have to win, lose, get on, fall out, make eye contact, collaborate, OMG. You have a partner. So um, it was truly an educational activity. It's not the only one. Other activities do exist and are available, but not at a mainstream school near you. The need to get on with others. This is huge. It's people, everywhere you look around, people are really struggling to get on. Maybe not in Glastonbury. I mean, I've been here a day and I've been overwhelmed with the friendliness here. So... You have to just imagine that you're living in Manchester when you hear stuff like this. Or Leeds or Liverpool or Birmingham or London. How to manage feelings, another huge one. If you're a boy, boys don't cry, do they? But a boy that doesn't cry becomes a, a man who's struggling, dysfunctional. Nonviolent communication, another big one. How to express your needs without offending. It's really, really difficult. And don't think that 
I don't have any of these problems. I have them all, you know, because I was schooled. And that's why I've got them all. Purpose and meaning of life. Okay, well, that one I'm kind of working on. You know, doing these talks gives me purpose. So I can tick one box. What do we not learn at school? True democracy. I've touched on that. You don't get a say. And you're happy to become an adult that doesn't get a say, but does get a vote. And since when was a vote having a say? Just ask Tony Benn. Well, you can't ask him now, but he was famous for saying that if voting made a difference, they would have abolished it a long time ago. And that's what the schooling method is. It's, it's non, non, it's, you can put your hand up, but it won't make any difference. That's a vote. Healthy respect for elders. Well, most children who've been schooled don't have that. You, you only have to see them smash bus shelters and rip train carriage furniture. They've lost the respect. But they, they did have it, but it was ripped out of them by neglect and the way they're treated at school, in my view. How to use your intuition? Well, there's a lot of people using their intuition in Glastonbury. But I tell you what, there's not a lot of people doing it in Manchester. How to know yourself? Well, that's one of the reasons that we've been born, I would think, is to learn, learn who we are. If you're not learning who you are, why have you been born? How to read others? Well, that's interaction with others, how to read them. How do you tell a friend from a foe? If you can't tell a friend from a foe, there's going to be problems. So we need tools. Those tools do exist but they're not looked at in school. When to follow good instinct, this is similar. How do you know you're on the right path? You've got a gut, there are three brains, again, the latest science. School works on one half of one brain, left side of the head brain. What about your heart brain? It's the first anatomical piece that appears in your mother's womb is your heart brain. The very, very first cellular structure is the brain of the heart. That's how important the heart is. It's not just a pump. Current medical science says, oh, it's just a pump. It's really connected to who you really are. How to be hungry learners. Oh, by the way, I mentioned three brains. The third one is uh, the gut brain, which is back to um, intuition and gut instinct. How to be hungry learners. I was a non-learner, apathetic, nihilistic non-learner for two decades after my schooling. I'd been force-fed such rubbish. Oh, I, I had so many qualifications. But qualifications, be wary of qualifications. Which do you prefer, a success or a qualified success? Qualification is a limitation. You have, to wear, you, you have to know your way around the English language. It's a very deceptive language. And more about that later. How user-friendly does this place look and what does it remind you of? What does it remind you of in one word? Prison. Thank you. I always get that one word answer. I love it. Of course, it's a prison. Well, it's meant to be a school, but it looks like a prison. One Canadian parent uh, took his child out of school when he realised that schools were made with the same materials by the same companies that build prisons. This was in Canada. And he now runs some kind of learning centre in Bali. What's the difference between a school and a prison? The telephone number. Henry David Thoreau said most people lead lives of quiet desperation. I would say most pupils lead lives of quiet desperation. You can fit in, but there's a price to pay. 
So I paid that price because I excelled at school because I'd, after an early start, because I don't have enough time to go through my start at school. Um, you can read about it in the book. Second shameless plug. Uh, I decided that rather than book the system, I would um, rather than beat them, I joined them. But that came at a cost of um, men, you know, mental health. When you use that phrase, mental health, people go, oh, we must pull, poor fellow, must be, must have, those medications must have been terrible. No, it's just a, it just means that I wasn't optimally fulfilled or happy. There was just, life was just grey and kind of meaningless. That's what I mean by mental health issues. Other people might disagree, by the way. Here's a bit of wordplay. Academic. Oxford English Dictionary definition. I'm not making this up, I promise you. Of no practical value. If you don't believe me, go home and look it up. Career. Occupation. Military term. Undertaken for a significant period of a person's life. As a verb, it means move swiftly and in an uncontrolled way in a specified direction. Put all that together. Academic career is basically something that you do that takes up the best part of your life that's of no practical value and means you've lost control of your entire life. So they are telling us, guys, we are informed. If we know where to look, the, the clues are all there. Now, I, like I said, excelled academically. It's all I could think of to do. Ended up going to a nice university, thank you very much, and then got a job, and it is a job, as a lawyer, legal aid lawyer. But that was my career. I soon quit to have a life. Because my health was suffering, because my body was saying... This is not a life. Get the heck out. So I did. I listened to my body. That's another thing. There's an entire book being written about that called Listen to Your Body, Your Best Friend on Earth. Listen to Your Body. And by the way, I had symptoms of um, chronic symptoms which, as soon as I got out and started living life, never came back. It was colitis, I think it was. Um, and my doctor offered me, this is back in the day when I did consult doctors, long, long, long time ago, last time actually, and he offered me a pill. Here you go, here's the solution. No, it's not. That's not the solution. There must be another way. And I found the other way. I got, got the heck out of there. Schooling separates controls and inhibits growth. Yep, that guy on the right with his face buried, well, almost buried in his hands, sums up what I've seen, what I experienced at school and what, I, what I've seen around the country. One girl, when I visited a school, giving them this activity, this card game, one girl for my, it was a follow-up session, I don't normally do follow-up sessions, normally I just one-off, and go. And if they want to follow it up, I give them the materials that they can use to follow up. And I did a follow-up session. I just wanted to see what happens at these follow-up sessions. And there was this girl there, never forget, I had these thick, black-rimmed glasses. And the teacher said to her, um, Katie, what are you doing with glasses on? And I thought, mm, that's an odd question. And Katie said, well, I need, to see, um, I need to see the information that David's putting on the, um, on the board. And the teacher said, yeah, but I've never seen you wear glasses. And this girl had been in her class for 18 months, at least. And the girl said, well, I've never been interested enough to put them on, miss. <laughs> I know it's kind of funny, but... You know, there's part of me that wants to laugh, but it's, this is how bad it is, folks. I've had children come in and say, David, I'm only coming in to play this card game, otherwise I'm off, I'm bunking, truanting, I'm off, I'm out of here. Yeah? Hmm. 
Dear Board of Education, so are we. <laughs> Not all classrooms have four walls. The idea is that we're born on a planet and that's our classroom. We don't need another classroom. You can choose to create your own classroom now. We have the technology. But we don't need a state-run or local authority-run classroom. We just don't need them. The lesson is life. Now, I gave a talk recently with a primary teacher, lovely guy, compassionate guy. He got me in specially to help do the talk. And he's a young fella, and he's already dis severely disillusioned. He actually admitted to the audience that he feels like a warehouse manager. He's managing, he's warehousing 30 children so that 60-ish, 55 parents can go off and be productive while he supervises, just watches over them, basically. Now, if the system was more honest and said, we're going to appoint children's supervisors, like inmate supervisors, mini prisoner supervisors, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, probably wouldn't even be standing here because you know what you're dealing with then, don't you? And you can take it or leave it, keep your child at home or send it off to be supervised in a boot camp prison environment. But the system, being the good little narcissist that it is, is never wrong and doesn't tell you the, the full story. And when you, as Andy and Sheila were saying, as when you do tell the full story, it will shut you down increasingly, more and more every day. Education, from the Latin, it's the only thing that I think I can say is, helps me in the talk that I learned at school. E means out and ducari means to draw. So it draws, you're drawing out. So children, especially these so-called rainbow children, crystals, I call them high definitions, you can spot them a mile off. They just look like they have, they can be six or seven years old. They're already as articulate as we were when we were 20. They know stuff that we, even, even now some of us, many of us don't know. All they need is the opportunity and the freedom to have their gifts and talents and their downloads expressed. They certainly don't need the compression of the schooling system, that would kill them. It would morally kill them initially, but eventually physically as well, in my opinion. Now, this is uh, taken at one of my train. Uh, it's not a tra well. I suppose it's an instruction. It's to get them going. I just teach them the rules of the game. But if you look closely, there's two boys top left who are kind of um, having a bit of an argument, but they, they're sorting it themselves. They don't look as though they're playing the game, but they are. They have a little one or two minute interlude where they address some interpersonal issues. Teacher doesn't seem to be bothered. She's looking away. I've had uh, bigger events. I've had uh, girls burst out crying. Never found out why. I wasn't interested. Teacher, teacher's... Reaction when they see a, a child crying. It wasn't a child, it was actually, well, I can't remember, maybe 13. And the teacher wants to control, ask questions. Who made you cry? Why are you crying? And, I, and bless her, she just took my, she took the lead from me and I was doing nothing. So she did nothing. And within a minute, the same girl was laughing. So if we interfere with children, we're, gonna, we're going to curtail we're going to stifle their natural resilience. We do too much. We have very little to teach them. Maybe the highway code, if they're driving. Not much else. They'll pick it up as they go along. That's the history of the human race. If we are evolving, and sometimes you wonder, we've picked it up as we've gone along, haven't we? We haven't been to class So, joyful learning. They have eye contact when they play. You can just see from the picture. Well, I hope you can. Can you see from the picture? Yeah? Is that a nod? That they're 
having fun, they're engaged. Yeah? I once did a session with 140 pupils in Liverpool. Liverpool. Learning simultaneously. Didn't have a problem. Not a single problem. Then we did a competition for 200, of more or less the same, 200. Parents were sat round the sides, their knees trembling. You know, no reason to panic. Children were engaged. Engage them. Don't dictate to them. Don't tell them what to do, where to sit, where to go, what to think, what to believe, what to eat. Trial and error. Let them learn for themselves. Education is above all an experience of life. And that's how you learn anything, to be honest, from life. Schooling is basically just paperwork. And if you join the dots, you realise it's that paperwork that is now taking over all kinds of so-called professions. Police work is now paperwork. Medical work is now paperwork. Teaching is now paperwork. So the, it's a dehumanisation process that's going on. Paperwork will, now be, will soon become digital data handling. Well, it is already, isn't it? Hence the Data Protection Act. You know, we're being digitised, folks. We're disappearing. We have to reappear. We have to show up. Schooling is also how we are named, blamed, shamed and tamed. They give you a name when they announce it. Here, sir, madam, miss, whatever. Where you're blamed, it's always your fault. I have something called the trolley apology. If you try this, just try this. It's kind of a little test of um, how you've been schooled. Take a trolley in a supermarket and deliberately hit someone else's trolley. And I guarantee you, they will apologise. Happens to me every time. I mean, I don't go around, you know, I'm not, not like a, <laughs> I'm not like a supermarket menace, Dennis the Menace. But just occasionally, I, I, it's my little test of um, post-traumatic stress. You know, bash. Oh, sorry. Oh, what did you do? It was my, it was, I did it. Shamed, more about that later, and tamed, yes. You've got to be tamed. That's the whole point of schooling. We'll come to that in a minute, the eight functions. From a very early age, I've had to interrupt my education to go to school. And don't get me wrong, don't, don't, I'm not black and white here. It's not like the most amazing parents send their children to the most dark and dastardly schools. Parents also play their part in how, of course, it's, it's, it goes without saying. If you're born to dysfunctional parents, schooling will just kick you when you're down. But you're already down, aren't you? Uh, Einstein said something similar, apparently. Right, hands up who thinks that schooling is compulsory, that you have to send your children to school. Ooh, wow, you are in line, don't you? In Manchester, they all think it's compulsory. Right, good, it's not. But there's the reason why. Uh, section 36 of the Education Act 1944 and Section 7 of the 1996 Education Act. Yeah. What's compulsory? Well, the phrase that foxes a lot of people is compulsory school age. But you only have to educate a child. You don't have to send them to school. How many people have been involved in home education? Because I suspect this could... How many people have been home educated themselves or been involved in home education? Oh, it's not so many. Okay. But you, but you knew that law, though, didn't you? Yeah? Okay. Here we go, the eight functions of schooling. Originally six. This is not the guy that created, this is just um, a, a random add-in or add-on. The aim of public education is not to spread enlightenment at all. It's simply to reduce as many individuals as possible to the same safe level. Safe. If you're compliant, you're safe. To breed a standard citizenry, to put down dissent and originality. H.L. Mencken. So these six functions, which to, to which two have been added in more recent times, were originally postulated by um, a progressive educationalist called Alexander James Ingalls in a lecture of, in Harvard, at Harvard 19, in 1918. 
It was uncovered by John Taylor Gatto, a hero of mine who, to whom the book, third shameless plug, is d dedicated. He recently died, um, and he's a sad loss to, to this cause. He wrote, two, he wrote two famous books. One is uh, Weapons of Mass Instruction and Get Your Child Out of Public School Now, public being state school in America. So when John Taylor Gatto tried to uncover the lecture notes of Alexander James Ingalls, Harvard denied that they existed. But after a tip-off, he found them in some remote library somewhere. The first function that um, was highlighted in that lecture, so, so this is nothing new, 100 years ago this was. Compliance, do as you are told without question. I saw this recently at a primary school, just very near to me. So when we've got banks showing off their accreditations, we can see anything that a bank touches run a mile. If you're in the system, if you're in the corporate system, you are, you are in effect paid in banking currency because they've abolished money, but you won't learn that at school. So if you're in the system, and we all are to some degree or other, we're all corporate banking skivvies. So this school is proudly boasting that they are sponsored by a bank. I don't know about you, but that creeps me out, folks. Absolutely creeps me out. Second function, uniformity. Behave and think like everyone else. Put your head above the parapet and the firing squad. There you go. Their guns are always loaded. Yeah, they're ready for you. Do you see potential for individual growth here? all in a nice lame rows or columns, all looking the same way to the figure of authority whose word is gospel. Fast forward a few years and they end up here at college or university. Same model, all looking towards the same. I mean, you could say, hang on, David, we're all doing that to you right now. But the difference is I'm, I'm kind of with you, you know. <laughs> I'm at the back of the room as well. And, uh, and I'm informing you in a light-hearted, well, I don't know about light-hearted, but uh, inform giving you information that I think can be of practical value. And I'm not going to test you. Okay. Third function, social conditioning. Know your place. Crucial. You've got to know your place because there's a ready-made elite that needs you to know your place. Proud to conform. Well, I once wore one of those on my head. Didn't know then what I know now, but I was deeply suspicious. I felt very uncomfortable putting one of those on my head. What I've since found out is that it's symbolic. You put one of those things, they call them a mortar board, don't they? Put one of those on your head, it signifies that you cannot any longer, or you've been trained, not to think outside the box. It's a box, and you're thinking inside of it, which is why it fits nicely on your head. Someone's having a great giggle at our expense. They really are. And they're holding proudly on high their qualifications, their limitations. Is this the reward for conformity? Look at that. How humanizing is that? They're still looking the same way, but now they've got separators. Not just separators, but back to back. I wonder how many times a day they are actually allowed to turn to each other. Come to see me afterwards if you think you know the answer. I don't. Once? I don't know. No idea. But all I know is that they, if they were caught collaborating, turning to each other for a sustained conversation, 
carpeted. First warning. Fourth function, differentiation. Some people are better than you. And the quicker you understand that, the better life will be for, for all of us. So if you're offered something that's less than your, that doesn't match, that doesn't, is not in alignment with your full potential, ah, you'll settle for it. Because maybe somebody else deserves it more than me. They've got better grades. I'll just clean windows or sweep the streets or be someone's carer. Call bingo. Or become, become a speaker on the education system. You know, anything menial like that. But the point is that um, if you're born with a secret nugget that will be exposed one day to reveal who you really are, it's not going to happen if you keep on believing that you're well down the pecking order. It'll take your mind off the truth of who you really are. The problem is not that people are uneducated. The problem is that they are educated just enough to believe what they've been taught and not educated enough to question what they've been taught. When, um, when I was doing the research for the book, I had, home edu I had people saying that they wouldn't home educate because they didn't feel they were up to the job. So I, I saw the delicious irony. So why are you not up to the job of home educating? Is that because you've been schooled? You refuse to do the job that turned you into a person that can't do the job? Some irony there. The fifth function, humiliation. You have no unique value or potential. Elitism, the sixth function. You're a born leader of men. Have you ever wondered how some people have this natural tendency to dictate to others, to be confident public speakers, prime ministers, CEOs? It's just they've been specifically groomed for stardom for, for the power slots. The rest of us have to uh, take the slow train, you know? So, yeah. And if you believe that you are entitled, and if the school has also been at pains to make sure that you're abused in some way, I know someone features in the book that says that they used to have children trained to abuse the younger ones. So by the time you leave school, you'll have so much resentment against the human race, plus the elite entitlement. We're talking mainly about boarding schools, but they're not the only ones. So you'll have a lack of compassion from your stress, from your post-traumatic stress, plus the belief that you are God's gift. And now you can make decisions that affect millions of people without batting an eyelid. It's as clever as it's evil, folks. Here we go. The seventh function, deliberate dumbing down. You cannot be trusted to think. Uh, Charlotte, Isabel T Charlotte Thompson is a bit, Secretary of State for Education for Ronald Reagan, in her research, found that it is a deliberate policy. So I've added it as a seventh function. It is more recent, because uh, in the 19th century, 12-year-olds who are doing mask curriculum would now be university students. That's how dumbed down we are. So the 12, what we call year eight, I think it is now, year eight mass curriculum in the 19th century would now be on the university curriculum. But there's so much more. I don't have to tell you. It's, you know, they give you the answers. The answers are, you know, you know, multiple choice. The answers are there. Nothing to think about. You either know it or you don't. NASA's study of creative genius. Now, NASA is not renowned for its forward thinking, if you think about it. Um, but they, um, they, they've said that uh, they did a study, a longitudinal study, about 1,500 pupils or boys and girls at the age of five, 99% of them at the age of five categorized as genius. Five years later, after five years of schooling, the percentage was down to 50 Five years after that, 1%. 99% were now creatively challenged. 
or you could even say intellectually or mentally challenged. They couldn't think outside the box. They couldn't think creatively or laterally. The eighth function, which is I've added for those of uh, this is I think particularly for places like Glastonbury. Uh, soul, soul fragmentation. If you're not broken, we will break you. And the implications for soul fragmentation or the potential causes are having been punished. Were you ever punished, bullied, judged, threatened, blackmailed, abused, bellowed at, belittled, criticised, labelled, isolated? We have isolation booths now, consequences booths as well. This is soul fragmentation. This is how you become vulnerable to indoctrination and to accepting the unacceptable, because you're shattered. This is also how you end up with addictions, bad habits, health problems. A shattered soul becomes a shattered body. Everything's interconnected, and a shattered mind as well. Ridiculed. Fears and phobias. Well, I've had all of these, still got one or two of them, I suppose, to some degree. Learning phobia. Like I mentioned before, I had a learning phobia for 20 years. Didn't want to learn anything. Social phobia. Are you comfortable in a room full of strangers or do you need to have a little bevy before you can take on a group? Fear of failure. Fear of ridicule. Fear of success, by the way. It's not on the list, but I just thought I'd add that in. Fear of ridicule. Fear of authority. Public speaking fear. Fear of public speaking is huge. I mean, I... I I may seem comfortable to you, but it's years of discomfort I've had to come through, you know. And I'm a singer, so you learn to work with an audience by singing, you know. So I didn't go to, I didn't have that entitlement given to me when I was, you know. Scolding a child before he or she understands why they are being scolded can cause physical damage to the hippocampus. Again, Round about the age of seven or eight is the threshold. How many parents and teachers would change their behavior if they knew this? Dear teacher, I talk to everyone, so moving my seat won't help. <laughs> so did you leave school aware of your limitless potential to be spontaneously creative and ready to explore innate gifts and talents? Like this boy, I was inspired by an amazing pack of worksheets in elementary school that totally changed my life. Said no child ever. Or did you leave school so demoralized that you would be grateful for even a bullshit job? Now, bullshit job is not my phrase. It's a professor at London School of Economics. So he's qualified, isn't he, to talk about bullshit jobs. But there you go. Um, says that a bullshit job, he defines a bullshit job is a job that even the person doing it has no idea why they're doing it. And they're proliferating. Anything that's is potent, uh, predominantly paperwork, auditing, looking after goods, you know, like security, night, you know, night security. These, do we need these jobs? If we aren't being taught how to grow our own food, how to take care of ourselves and our families, and how to live without the need for huge governments, banks, and corporations, as our ancestors once did, then we aren't being educated. We're being indoctrinated to be dependent and subservient to the system. Gavin Nascimento. So school is at best fake education and at worst child abuse. I've already um, hinted at that. Which brings on post-traumatic stress disorder, and it's all around us. It's all around you. Just... I had somebody who read the book and said, David, thank you for the book. I said, why? He said, because I knew I had a problem. I just didn't know what it was. We have collective amnesia. Then there was a, cafe, a woman in a cafe. I asked her, "How did, did you enjoy school? She said, oh, yeah, it was fabulous. And I said, are you sure? I wasn't having that for an answer. Are you sure? She came back 10 minutes later. She said, Actually, you're right. I hated school. I'd forgotten how much I hated it. But I just had memory of my friends. I enjoyed their company. Same with me. I hated school. 
I love the table tennis, the bridge, the football. You know? So that's um, amnesia, that's self-protective amnesia, folks. So we need an antidote. The antidote for children is very, very, very well, and for adults, actually, very straightforward. Freedom. Give children freedom. And they will thrive and flourish. They will naturally interact playfully, imaginatively and creatively. That's what children do. We need to be more like they are. Skip. When was the last time anyone skipped in the street? Any takers? Thank you. Oh, you had a witness. Excellent. Fantastic. But it was led, this skipping presumably was his aunt. Right, okay. So a grandmother, is it grandmother? Skips with her grandchild who hasn't been to school. I actually skipped yesterday by myself. I was happy to be here, happy to be in Glastonbury. Skipped down the street. And I don't drink alcohol. <laughs> Hungry learning, in case you were wondering. Hungry learning, hungry learners, oh, wow, isn't life so sweet when you're learning hungrily? But if you're force-fed, you just get chronic indigestion. A Chinese businessman has shared this image saying that happiness of children, bless him, is the most valuable thing in the world. A million dollar worth Lamborghini is nothing, nothing in front of that. So he allows the kids to jump and play on this Lamborghini. The best part is that the kids are not his and neither is the Lamborghini. <laughs> but it's the thought that counts. It's the thought that counts. The antidote for adults, self-love. Now, places like Glastonbury and Salisbury, Torquay, and other places use the word love quite a lot. I tend to avoid the word love. I prefer the phrase self-love. Because you need a source. If you're going to love, you need a source, don't you? Where's that source? It's inside, isn't it? It's the heart. It's the heart. No self-love, no love. Simple equation. No cash, no gift. Not a great analogy, but it'll do for now. Yeah? Self-love has various aspects. And if you're self-loving, and I like to think my last ooh, 20 years have been far more self-loving than the first... Uh -huh, uh -huh. Some number greater than 20. Um, time. Reclaim your time. The most valuable, the most valuable commodity we have. <laughs> Synchronicity, eh? The most valuable commodity we have is time. Obviously, there's water, food, etc., but it's time. If you're following the school model and giving your time away to others, to the system, to the beast that is the system, are you really self-loving? True feelings, true feelings about self and others. You're all right, you know where I come from, it's all, you're all right, and you find yourself saying, yeah, I'm all right, you're all right, yeah, I'm all right. No, we need to stop that, are you all right? No, I feel terrible today, actually. Try that. I'm going to try it. They're going to run away. Certainly in Manchester, they're going to, they're going to call a taxi, but it's so fast, you know? Taxi! But in Glastonbury, I think you might get a better response. I feel terrible. Why do you feel so bad? I don't know. Could be the chemtrailing. Could be um, the bankster conspiracies. I don't know. It's all getting too much for me. Oops, back. Sole purpose, true purpose. Because if you're not living your purpose, what, whose life are you living? Reclaiming your time, be less busy, be more available. So a student I had recently said that he'd offered, he'd put in an offer to be paid less. I said, paid less, what do you mean? 
He said, well, if they pay me less, I can go home earlier. He's reclaiming his time. This is a French train driver. How random is that? Be more available to self and others. So many people from Monday to Friday, you don't even bother contacting them because they're not available. And then they're not available at weekends because they weren't available so much during the week that they're now no longer available because they've got washing, shopping, ironing, cooking, cleaning, grandkids. Reclaim your true feelings. Be authentic. Stop pretending. It's very, very healing to be authentic. And it's... Never too late to be authentic. Find your Ishigai. This is a Japanese concept. Basically, if you are born with a passion, and we all are, and you develop the skill that goes with that passion, it becomes your vocation. Teachers used to be vocational back in the day, but they've been phased out. Mission. If the skill is needed by society, it becomes your mission. And then eventually you'll be rewarded for it financially profession. But if you are following your original flame of passion, you will never work, according to the Chinese saying, you won't work a day in your life. You won't be doing a job. Certainly not a bullshit job. That's the last thing you'll be doing. Good news. Nature is on our side. Neuroplasticity plasticity means it's never too late. However abusive or traumatic your upbringing or schooling was, you can turn it around just like that. That is how amazing we are. But you won't turn it around if you don't know there's anything to turn around. Sometimes it's obvious, but sometimes it's not so obvious. You can always repot the plant. Always. No exceptions. You may find lots of people who go to counselling and what have you. Oh, I can't repot my plant, I need help. It's just posturing. Posturing. And it's a neediness for attention, in my opinion. They can always do it themselves. Don't forget to drink water, get some sun. You're basically a house plant with complicated emotions. <laughs> I said I'd end up on a positive note. I think that is the last It is. So... I hope it's been an education, and uh, thank you very much for your kind attention, and um, see you around, because I'm staying for the weekend. <laughs>